in this computer. There we go. Awesome. All right. Hey everyone, my name is Alex Antonison. I'm both the organizer of Data Nerds and I'm also the speaker tonight. Um, and I've continued to sponsor Data Nerds through my consulting group, ACG. Uh, just a little bit about that. You know, my focus is to work with my clients to help provide them solutions that grow through efficiency, offering services in data engineering and architecture and data science. My new gig with the MTSU means I get to pursue that full time. So if you think there's any opportunity there, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, some associated organizations that I'm just huge fans of is one is Natural Software School. They are a nonprofit boot camp where they, uh, if you're looking to kind of level up in tech, uh, you know, ranging from data analytics, data science, uh, software development, many more, highly recommend checking them out. Um, have, I've had a lot of their students speak at Data Nerds. Uh, really, you know, really enjoyed that. Another that I mentioned earlier is Penn University. Uh, we are a nationwide community of people that just get together and we, you know, primarily it's Slack based, but we just kind of, it's a place where you can bounce ideas off people and we have a lot of conversations, um, not just about data, but, you know, we have software developers, investors, um, you know, all sorts of people that just, you know, really it's about having uh, conversations uh, with people, you know, that are also interested. Okay, tonight's format is gonna be a bit different uh, than usual. Um, so I'm not gonna have a moderator tonight. I'm gonna be moderating myself, um, which I guess not really moderating, um, but I have broken the slides up into individual sections based on the order I'd like to discuss. And the thought process is, is that I'll cover a topic We'll talk about it and then we'll move on. And you know, if we hit 6.30 and we haven't discussed everything, that's okay. I've ordered it based on importance. Um, and you know, maybe in a future day, I might, you know, I might have a part two of this where we dive into whatever parts we didn't get to discuss tonight. Um, but one thing I'd like to say, like feel free to post, you know, while I'll just go through the whole topic, feel free to post questions in the chat. Um, you know, and when I finish the section, I'll then bring the chat up and just kind of go through anything that comes up. So, all right, without further ado, let's get into a nerdy dive into data tools. So when I first thought of this topic, um, I was thinking it was going to be a bit more tools based, but then as I was writing it, I realized I actually wanted to touch on first, why do we care about data tools? And what are my general steps and recommendations when it comes to making picking data tools? Um, this is important because I, I think it's good to always have just like good practices when I'm, when I'm picking the tools. So you prevent picking maybe tools that actually end up hurting you and causing you to um, you know, not be as efficient. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Why do we care about data tools? So to kind of borrow from project management, you know, there's a scope quality triangle. Whenever you're picking out a data tool, you know, ideally it's supposed to save you time, save you money, and improve quality. Those are really the three axes, like the three things that I look at whenever I'm picking a tool. Um, because more often than not, you know, we're all in the solutions of we're all in the business of making solutions with data. Even if it's for personal or professional in a business setting, we're all trying to do something with data, and we're using tools to help us do that more efficiently. And that was that. So I don't, I don't really see there being much discussion there. That was just kind of a highlight. Um, so I'll just go ahead and dive into general steps on picking data, uh, data tools. Have a clear problem statement. This is a really important thing to note because if you don't have a good problem statement of what problem you're trying to solve, you could end up going down solution paths that don't really make sense for you. You know, a good example is if you're processing gigabytes of data versus maybe terabytes of data, maybe you shouldn't use Spark. Maybe Pandas is probably okay for you. Um, you know, but it's, it's good to just get that well-defined up front. You know, what volume of data are you working with? How fast is it coming in? Is it streaming? Is it batch? You know, these are all things that you just wanna very tightly understand before you seek out to pick a data tool because it will really inform what tools you should be looking at. This is another thing I think is really important that gets overlooked at a lot of companies. See what tools other people are already using. Um, it could be that in your company or team, there's already a tool that exists that solves the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, and adding a new technology to a team can be very expensive in both 
infrastructure wise, skill wise, you know, and skill wise, it could be you have to hire people, you have to hire consultants, and or you have to do training to level up your current workforce. Um, and, and second, I mean, there may already be that tool that can solve the problem. You don't want to have two tools that solve the same problem because that presents new problems. <clears throat> Most problems do not need state of the art. I cannot say this enough. While state of the art is cool, and I personally love tinkering with state of the art stuff, um, most you know most problems you don't need state of the art solutions. State of the art solutions can oftentimes come with a lot of overhead to manage, um, require specific skill sets, and if you haven't worked with that system before, you know you're having to take time to learn. And in a lot of business settings, you're not going to be really given that time. Um, so I always am going to like push for before considering a state of the art solution, uh, explore something simpler that require, you know, a lower lift to implement, you know, a good example like I like to give people is before you dive into deep neural networks, you should probably consider some form of regression based technique to see how well you can solve the problem that way. Because uh, deep neural networks requires a lot of, it's a black box, it's a lot harder for interpretability, uh, there's a lot of understanding you need to have to get it working, um, and not to trivialize regression techniques, there's a lot of skill that comes into that, but it is a much simpler, elegant solution that I, you know, recommend exploring first. New tools equal less stack overflow questions. Um, Excel for everything. Excel was very popular in the survey. I was uh, not surprised at all. In fact, I thought it was going to be uh, one of the top tools. Um, anything? Alex, right. where oh. do you where do you sit on kind of overcoming inertia, if you will? Like you know, there's a better tool, but no one wants to change. Like. How often is that the biggest issue? And, and have you known any situations where that's overcome? Um, that is a great question. Uh, usually it's hard, especially it depends. Like if you're in a startup setting, it's not as hard. In an enterprise setting, it is very hard. Um, you know, and one of the reasons I left enterprises uh, was because I got frustrated at, at how hard it was to get over that, you know, writing proposals, building prototypes. Um, you know, you have to effectively tie it to business value. Um, how, how am I going to save money? How am I going to reduce, uh, you know, how am I going to reduce cost? You know, those three things before you just have to hammer home and build that out. Um, and it's just time intensive. Um, I've experienced the opposite in the startup space where there isn't that problem. There's not that inertia. Uh, yeah, a lot of negotiating. It's a lot of negotiating because Adopting a tool, and I mean, I can also appreciate adopting a tool, there's a lot of time, like I just mentioned before, there's potentially new infrastructure you're having to invest in. Uh, if you don't have people employed in the company that know the tool, then you're having to hire consultants. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, in a business setting, there's always the bottom line, you then have to kind of make that justification of how is it going to like move that bottom line and it may be you have to do that initial capital investment. But if you can prove that the ROI will exceed that. Um, that's how I've done it in the past. But, you know, I will say like, it's one of the reasons I left working for, for much larger organizations because that is, it's challenging and it's a lot of paperwork. Cause there's also like the security component, like don't even like, you know, all that, like not even bringing up the security component um, where you have to like have your applications go through security review to get approved and yeah. I guess swinging the other way as well, like how, how long is long enough? I've just gone from working at a startup to an enterprise and at the startup, they kept changing their mind. So mm -hmm. you'd like start using one tool. They'd be like, no, we're going to use this. No, we're going to use this. Like how long is long enough, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like that's been like the opposite, you know, like going from an enterprise where it was like pulling teeth to get like something simple um like added to the tech stack that we had no other solution in the org to, that did it and it was going to be a net benefit but it was like really difficult um to going to startup space where like every other team is using their own like completely different tool set their own project management tool their own like ticket tool like all all different things across different teams um and yeah uh, so and there's pros and cons 
Um, you know, on the startup space, it allows you to be more nimble. I do think being there is something as being too nimble. Um, yeah, no, Tim, that's a great point. It is typically a, a people problem, um, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. It is, you know, figuring out people, figuring out what their motivations are and working out how to align your, your vision with how they, you know, from their perspective. Because we also, you know, we all have our own filters. I, as a data engineer, have my filter. You, as a data scientist, have you, your filter. We have someone from InfoSec here. They have their own filter. We all look at different problems differently. You know, an InfoSec person, you're, they're probably thinking more about like um, the threat vector. You know, how does this impact? And correct me if I'm saying like, threat vector. I think that's a thing. Like, you know, your attack space. Um, um, you know, so you being careful, cognizant of that. Tech surface. Awesome. Thank you. I have a friend who works in cybersecurity, so I've, I've picked up a word or two. Um, anything else? Awesome. All right. So this is more, I just kind of shoved this in here because this is something near and dear to me. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and I've, I've personally built, you know, I, I say I've built my career in automation when I talk to a lot of folks as a data engineer, you know, what I've done is I've taken processes that more often than not were being done by an analyst manually, and I automated it and helped do it at scale. Um, so I always like to say, like, as, as an engineer, my job is to automate things. Or when I worked with the data science group, my job was to automate the process of deploying their machine learning models more efficiently. Um, so automation is, is really important to me. And I'll just say, anytime there's any task you're just doing in a repetitive fashion or maybe slight variances to it, you know, definitely consider trying to automate it. So the benefits of automation, first off, you're going to save yourself time. This is, you know, it's kind of, you know, to me, it's pretty obvious, you know, if you automate something, you're not having to manually step through it. You know, if you write a script or use a tool, um, it'll take care of it for you, or if you get it down to a button push. Uh, more often than not, you're going to save, you're going to improve quality of the process because we as people are terrible at doing repetitive things. Uh, if you didn't sleep great the night before and haven't had your cup of coffee yet, you could miss something. It's entirely possible. Uh, so anytime what I say is when you have a human in the loop, you're going to have someone, you know, you're going to have that, you know, chance of error. Um, so by automating something, you're going to improve quality. Uh, more often than that, you're going to learn a lot about your process as you automate it in a tool or code, because there might be aspects of it that you just kind of mindlessly do, especially if you've been doing it for months or even years. Um, so once you actually start automating it, you're going to learn those like, nuanced little pieces where, uh, oh, I didn't realize I was doing this every day. Um, and the last but not least is other people can help you with your process. And I cannot stress this enough. I've worked at a lot of companies where there was the one person and it was his or her job, uh, you know, or their job to, to manage X process. And it was a struggle for them to go on vacation because them going on vacation meant some business critical thing wasn't getting done. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just uh, a frustrating place to see someone. Steps for automating something. First, I'm gonna always say, keep it simple from the start and start with what you understand best. Um, those are two really important things because if you try and go like really hard in on like future proofing and making it the best thing ever, it's gonna take longer for you to implement. And more often than not, if you're, especially if you're automating your own process, you're still gonna to have to do the process while you're automating it. So if you can just get something done, it allows for a quick win. And I always like to say, in the absence of any automation, something is better. Something is better. You're gonna save a little bit of time. And if you just automate, you know, you iterate and add features as you go, you're gonna save yourself a bit more time, a bit more time. And down the road, you may need to rebuild it because you've built maybe a lot of one-off automations that maybe don't work really well mesh well together. You may want to consider a framework or a better tool suite. Um, but first off, you've automated a lot of these processes, so you're saving yourself time. But you also have the benefits of everything you've learned from the process of automating it. So when it comes time to picking a tool or something, like I mentioned before, you'll have a clear problem statement and you have a good understanding of what you're trying to do. So that'll just be a really big benefit there.
All right. Anything on automation? I get excited about it, but I get it. <laughs> um, so we're gonna dive into environment management. So what is an environment? An environment is the context in which a program or application is running on your computer. And you can use environments to uh, manage your configurations from like development to production, secrets, which is anything like, like a sensitive like password or token. You can use it for managing your programming packages. And then you can even using some like something like Docker, which manages everything from like operating system and system dependencies. So configuration, what do I mean by like configuration? So an example of what I'm saying, like in the context of configurations is like the concept between I have my development environment, which is where, you know, if you're not familiar with like engineering like practices, you typically develop things locally or in, you know, in a secluded development environment that's going to use different data sources, different databases than your production environment. What is a production environment? Production environment is the way I like to, you know, kind of speak about it is that it's any process or application that is being used to support business operations. So even, I mean, if you have a SQL query that you run and those results are going to someone, I consider that production code because that is being used to support some sort of business operation. Um, so what you can do when managing your environment, instead of going in your code and changing things out manually, if you use your environment to manage those configurations, you have your development environment set up. So you're developing locally. And then when it comes time to deploying your code uh, or application into production, you're not having to change anything. There's no concept of like, okay, I have my dev version and my prod version. You just push your code. Um, and nothing has to change. The environments manage those configurations. So secrets management is a specific type of configuration, but I like to call it out. Um, a secret is, you know, like I said before, it's anything that's like sensitive, you know, your database, password, uh, an API token. These are all things that, you know, you really never want to store directly in your projects. Uh, so there's a handful of ways I talk about in the resources section about better ways of managing your secrets um, in, a, like a, in a programmatic fashion. Programming virtual environments. So some of you may have, you know, are familiar with this. So virtual environment, PIPBAMF, Poetry, REV, Packrat. These are all examples of programming in virtual environments. And what does it do? It allows you to manage specific versions of a project. And that, you know, if, if you're not familiar with it, you know, I highly recommend checking it out. It's, to me, the biggest thing is reproducibility. You know, I don't, I'm, I don't know if, how many of you have maybe experienced this, but say you develop a project, you sit it down for a year, you come back to it a year later, and you can't get it to run. Uh, well, what's happened over that year is you, you know, you initially developed it with certain set packages uh, in your global environment. And then since then, you probably added new packages. And when you add a new package, what more often they'll happen is it will upgrade other packages just in the background, you know, without your, without your knowing, because that's just how package managers work. So a year later, you can end up not even being able to run your project. Another thing is that I'm sure, you know, we're all, you know, in like in a collaboration setting, to try and share your project with someone and you're not using a, like a virtual environment to help manage that, it's going to be challenging because you can't guarantee that necessarily they'll have the same packages on their computer as you have on yours. And there can be wide differences in how packages function. I mean, some instances, packages can deprecate functions and features, or they can you know, be a bit more nuanced. Like in data science, this is really important because if you're using different versions of packages, they can calculate things slightly differently. So you can end up getting different results. Uh, and last but not least, it is absolutely a necessity. You know, anything that's like production phase, highly recommend checking out virtual environments. Um, you know, to make sure that whatever you're developing locally is going to be similar to the system that you're going to deploy into. Now, Docker is where I'm kind of breaking my rule of not talking about tools, but it's just such a great tool. Um, where it goes a step beyond just managing packages, it actually allows you to manage your entire environment. You know, that includes operating systems, system dependencies. It's really useful for 
ensuring anyone can run your project and also ensuring that wherever you're running it, it will run the same elsewhere. Uh, it's very commonly used in engineering teams, but I, even if you're just a data, if, if you're just in a data scientist, a data analyst, um, I, I think it's worth checking out because it's just a good tool that can kind of help say, you know, if you're trying to spin up something in TensorFlow and you're struggling, you know, recommend checking out the TensorFlow Docker container because that, you know, make things a little easier there. Okay. Uh, have you seen any tracking on Podman? I'm not familiar with Podman. Traction. Traction on Podman. What is Podman? Is it a... Uh, Oh, it's supposed to be a replacement of Docker. No, I've um, pod manager. I'll have to add this to my list of things to check out. Where's the line between just a package manager and going full container? Like what point in a project should you be thinking I need a full container? Or is it immediate? Like, should you? Uh, really no. Um, so like a good example, like my, you know, I published a GitHub repo uh, where I did my code for processing the survey results. I don't really need to do a Docker container there. It's a pretty simple thing. Um, I think there's a complexity thresh threshold or like whenever I'm doing web scraping, I'm going to do that in a container because then I'm also having to factor in uh, like web browsers and stuff like that. So really, I would just say, Anytime you're working on something where there, your system dependencies matter. Um, another thing is that maybe you're collaborating with someone who works in Windows. You know, I'm a Mac person. If I'm collaborating someone in Windows, it's easier if we just work in Docker because then we get rid of the concern of, um, of environments because it doesn't matter because um, it's all contained. But I will say it's definitely everything should be in a, you know, use some sort of virtual environment tool. Not everything needs to be Docker. Um, and what that threshold is, it's hard to say. I'd say just some level of complexity and or, um, you know, collaboration. Cool. Thank you. Of course. Red Hat's behind it. Interesting. No. Um, so I included a full, all the things I said in the resources below. Um, but real quick, so my favorite one is poetry. It's actually one that I got recently um, recommended to me and I've been playing with it and I've really liked poetry for Python. Um, for R, oh yeah, poetry, yeah. I, I just started using it about five, six months ago and it's been life-changing. It's I like it way better than pip -M. Um For R, two that I'm a fan of, actually the one I like the most is REMV for R. Uh, there's also pack rat, but I'm, I'm not as big of a fan of that. RMV has matured to the point where I'm, I feel confident recommending it. But yeah, I have links in the very end where, you know, links to everything. Why do you like poetry better than pip -in? Um, Just the user experience. Um, I've just specifying everything in the, I use a PyProject Toml, just putting everything in there and have to do like a pip file. Um, it's just been easier to use. I was I would run into like sometimes where where pip env was uh, running into like dependency issues and stuff like that, and I don't know. Uh, it just it has it's felt easier. It's hard to it's hard to say because they functionally do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that there were just enough instances where I got frustrated with pip pip uh, pip env. So I actually ended up for a lot of projects just using Python's virtual environment built in and only would switch to pip env if I needed the concept of like pinning packages and stuff like that. Um, I haven't had any problems with poetry, so I'm just using poetry on everything now. Gotcha. Um, I think that's, and it could have been user error. I mean, I'm not, not, not trying to dog on pip env, um, but just from like, a, you know, when I was using it, I just would get a little frustrated. So, so we've got like, we've got pip env for our main stuff and then we've got another like, documentation place that's poetry um, for the virtual environment. So going from hip in to poetry for one thing was was a little bit of, it, it, it was just different to set up, I guess. Oh yeah, to oh, it's totally. For the second time. Oh yeah, it's totally different. And I've benefited from someone who knows poetry really well, 
got me set up on it. And maybe that's the thing, like someone who knew poetry really well, like when I learned Pip M, I, I was self-taught. I just stumbled through it. Um, but I had someone who really knew poetry, poetry rail helped me get set up. So maybe that was, maybe that was the big difference. Um, but, but yeah, I actually use poetry for the, the script I use for processing the results data. All right. All right. Now the most uh, fun topic, programming languages. All right. So my, this is my programming languages. I know the top two technically are programming languages, but in my opinion, they're like the two most important things anyone who's working in data um, should learn and then kind of just kind of go from there. So SQL. I mean, I feel like most people, if you're working in data, you, you get this most usable data in an organization is stored in a database. It's just a fact. So knowing SQL empowers you to get access to that data. Um, you know, and even if you're, you know, a data engineer building like data pipelines, um, you know, like in PySpark, I mean, there's even Spark SQL. Um, um, so, Um, yeah, so that's SQL. So I put shell scripting next, not because I think it is like better than Python or any other language, but this is very useful for do streamlining a lot of tasks on a computer. And I mean, for anyone, like if you're copying files, if you're moving files, um, you know, a terminal is just an easier way of doing it in a repetitive fashion. And say you maybe need to do a couple different things. You can just write a shell script and just make copies of that and iterate. Or if you want to get fancy, you can parameterize it. Um, you know, it's a more efficient way of working with cloud providers, um, which, you know, a, a lot of people, I mean, cloud computing is becoming more and more common. Um, and user, the U, UI and most cloud providers, in my experience, have kind of been meh. Um, so using the CLI makes it a much better experience. And of course, you know, for Dell event tasks, super, super beneficial. So Python, why, why is Python one of my favorite languages? It is a general purpose languages that supports all types of data solutions ranging from analytics to engineering. Um, a lot of companies use it, which is good if you're like trying to get a job. Um, a lot of people use it, which is good for companies looking for people. So like there's just those two kind of things that kind of benefit from each other. Uh, another big thing is like all major cloud providers and data frameworks support it, which is important because if you pick maybe a less, you know, a different language, you know, you're going to run the risk of, you know, not having access to certain solutions because of the language you, pick, you chose. R and quote unquote, for data science. I love R. R is actually what I consider my second language. Um, I love doing statistical analysis in it, you know, exploratory data analysis, machine learning. These are all great things to do in R. It's a, it's a language built by statisticians for statisticians. It's not an engineering tool. Um, it just, it's just not. It's an afterthought. Um, you can do engineering with it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just not as robust as Python. Java and Scala for engineering. Um, Java has been around for a very long time um, and it has generally the same support as Python uh, with respect to cloud, you know, um, cloud platforms and data frameworks. And Scala is another really good language if you're you know, working in Spark and you need to develop highly performing Spark jobs, you know, Scala is a great language for that. And then uh, Julia is the last language I you know, want to bring up. Uh, it's a language that I haven't really spent much time with. Uh, but I discovered it back in 2015. I've kind of passively kept my eye on it. You know, it's a high level, high performance language built specifically for like computational tasks, like analysis and machine learning. Um, I've, I've met a handful of folks that typically if they've run into problems where Python can't do what they need, uh, they end up having to go to C or C++, you know, Julia is an alternative for that. So, okay, why do I think R is better? I mean, Python is better. Um, R, while great for data science, it just lacks features for building for, you know, robust production applications. Um, you know, that's an instance where I just say, pick, pick the language that's gonna best do the job. Um, while Java, Scala, and Julia, they all have benefits over Python. I am not gonna argue with Medium over that. Like, they all have benefits over Python. Um, but Python is still better in the following areas. One, 
it can span engineering and analytics very well. And I understand that it's not natively built into the language, but there's always a package and a large community behind those packages supporting them. So, okay, yeah, Python, Pandas isn't built directly into Python, so Python doesn't have the concept of a data frame, but we have Pandas, so um, that gets solved for. Python has a lower learning, to, learning to curve to learn. It's a lot easier for me to teach someone Python than it is for me to teach them Java and Scala, Scala um, you know, which you have to have maybe a bit more understanding of like object-oriented programming to build good applications around that. And just last but not least, you know, like I said before, Python has a greater market share for data teams. Which, which, is, which is important. I mean, you, you, know, you want to make sure you're picking a language that is well adopted. So, you know, you have better access to opportunities. The last thought I have on this is, should you know multiple languages? I get this question a lot. And my answer is for starters, no, don't, don't try and learn multiple languages. You'll end up getting overwhelmed because there's a lot of context switching that, you know, even I, when I switch between Python and R, there's a lot of context switching that I'm having to do where I'm having to rethink how I'm going to solve a problem. Uh, so it's better to first pick up SQL, recommend checking up Shell, and then pick one language. Obviously, my recommendation is Python, um, but pick one language and learn that language. Um, and once you've gotten later in your career, you feel confident in that first language you've picked, absolutely learning multiple languages can have numerous technical and professional benefits. You know, there's patterns you're going to learn from picking up another language that can even help you you know, improve writing in your original language. So, all right, let's, any discussion here? I felt like this was like the hottest topic. I had a quick question um, in regards to benefits. Is there a cost benefit? I know Python's mostly free, most libraries and packages, but I don't know anything about Scala or Julia. Are those open source as well? Yep, all open source. I only really look at open source languages. Okay. Uh, that's why, I mean, MATLAB is a very popular language in the, uh, you know, computational science space, but I don't consider it because it's behind a paywall and there's just so many good open source, you know, free languages out there um, that you're going to have better market share with because then, you know, MATLAB is really popular at universities, but I've yet to ever see a company, you know, or, you know, most companies are not using MATLAB. You're going to be using something like Python, Scala, Java, stuff, stuff like that. Hello. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, how do you come? Oh, so I know a little bit of Python, but most of my experience with SQL. Uh, what is Panda and Notebook in relationship to Python? That's part one. Second part is that how does Python scale? Because I know like SQL, uh, you know, you can have multiple CPUs on a, on a SQL uh, query, but how does that work in Python? Okay, so first, okay. Uh, the first question about what is pandas and notebooks to Python? So pandas is a library in Python that, you know, really changed, it really put Python in the data scene before pandas. Python really was really more sequestered to like software development and, and you know, applications in that realm. Uh, Pandas brought the concept of a data frame uh, to Python, which all a data frame is, is that it's a, a structured, it's a table. That's what a data frame is. There's some like fancy computer science-y things behind the scenes of what a data frame can do, but it's really just that gives you the concept of a table and then you can do um, manipulation of one on that table. A notebook, is uh, Jupyter. So Jupyter, no, Jupyter is a you know, open source uh, tool that came up with the concept of Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter Notebooks are helpful because it allows you to write snippets of code in a cell and then run that. And it just allows you to um, do data visualizations. It allows you to prototype. Um, it allows you to kind of be a bit more free with how you write the code versus like your, your standard Python script where you just have to, you know, either you're working in an interpreter like IPython or you are, you know, just having to run the whole script. So the second thing about scaling, um, I mean, that's a complex question. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Now, if like I'm writing something in Python, 
you know, I'll start off in pandas, but if I'm worried about scaling, I'll probably consider using something like Dask or PySpark. These are frameworks that are accessible to Python that allow for doing parallel compute. Um, in a similar way, you know, where you were talking about like in SQL, where you can run your SQL transformations on a database that itself is going to have, you know, its query optimizer that's going to allow you, you know, access all the resources on the server. Um, so, do you, uh, go ahead. I was, do you, though, like with Dask or something like that, offer an advantage over just kind of managing it in a distributed way with Python? Um, yes, because why reinvent the wheel? Someone else has already done it. So that's like, and I, I guess I didn't, I should have said this during the tools talk, but like, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, it's if someone, someone's already gone and figured out how to build a framework in Python that does distributed data management, um, you know, where there's opportunity to do parallel processing, all that fun stuff, you know, splitting the data out, doing calculations, merging it back together. Um, can you do it in Python? I'm sure, absolutely, it's totally possible. I mean, you could actually, you don't even really need pandas. You can do everything in Python with just the data structures native to Python. Uh, it's just these frameworks make it easier for you to do. Um, we have a hand up. Um, that was the person who just asked the question. Oh, oh, was that them? Okay, okay, awesome. I, I can't, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that name. So I wanted to, um, okay. Did that answer your question, sir? Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, awesome, awesome. And yes, everyone needs pandas, highly recommend it. Um, yeah, super like it's game changing. Um, R has the concept of a data frame built into it, um, which makes sense because, you know, by statisticians for statisticians. Um, but yeah, you have to use pandas really. So, okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, we'll get into the last part, which is are the tools around um, building data applications. Um, First and foremost, you know, source control is so important. You know, my, my, I always like to tell people, if your code is not in source control, it doesn't exist. Flat out doesn't exist because it is not in a managed system that other people can access. Um, and yes, you can push code to like a shared drive and stuff like that, but you're not gonna get the benefits of uh, diff, you know, doing difference in differences in versions of your code um, and GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket all, it runs on my machine, I know. Um, it's, it's really accessible now. Uh, there's tons of content out there about how to get started and GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket all offer really generous free tiers. Um, also, just from a professional development perspective, I recommend everyone just have a GitHub and just put some stuff on there. You know, especially if you're looking to get a job, employers do, you know, employers do look at that. Um, you know, I know there's there's some challenging aspects of it there. Um, like if you work professionally, you may not have as much on there, but it's just good to have something, um, you know, when you're doing your personal projects. Cookie cutter. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, cookie cutter is a great templating tool. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to create a template of a project that can be parameterized. Um, and this is really helpful for standardization you know, when I talk to people about this, the way I like to say it is like, you know, imagine I'm cooking in my kitchen. I know where everything is. Now, if I go to my friend's kitchen, I'm not going to know where anything is because my friend's going to organize it how he wants to organize it. Imagine a world where I organize my, he organizes his kitchen the same way as me because we're using the same cookie cutter template. Now, when I go into his kitchen, I can be productive immediately and cook things because of the fact I know where everything is. Um, and last is that it helps reduce the um, you know, activation energy of getting a project going. Um, because if there's a template there, it can kind of guide you on maybe what packages should you be using? How should you project your structure your project? Um, maybe set up unit testing. I've talked to so many people about unit testing that they don't do it because they just don't know how it works. Um, and when I just show them, this is a unit test. It's as simple. This is how you set it up. This is how it works. 
Um, and I've been able to kind of help adoption with that by just giving people access to it. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, that's a huge fan of that. And I'm gonna be building a lot of cookie cutter templates in, uh, in the coming year, doing a lot of like specific data engineering and data science tasks. Um, code formatting and linting. Um, this is actually something that I only started using about a year or two ago, and it has been pretty game changing for me. Um, I'm a huge fan of all types of code formatters um, because it takes the it takes the arguments out of how you format your code. I've been in so many teams where we try to come up with like a coding standard and stuff like that, and it can sometimes actually get a bit heated. Uh, code formatters are great because one, you're not having to do it, and two, everyone's following using the same formatter. Um, and it kind of just ensures that kind of same consistency across the team and the same example of like kitchen, you know, if your code is formatted the same way as everyone else's, it's going to just be easier for people to comprehend. Um, code linters are really, really helpful for improving your overall code quality. Uh, Flake 8 is just a good example of one. You know, I always like to talk to people about um, when you are you know, using packages, you know, in a project and you import them, you know, but say you decide, I don't want to use that package anymore, but you leave that import in place. Well, those imports can build up over time and you can kind of end up with float. Uh, so something like Flake 8 can tell you, hey, you, you're not using this import, you should remove it from the project. Yep, SQL fluff. Automated testing. So this was something I was just bringing up a little bit ago. Um, automated testing can really help you know, improve your overall code quality, um, you know, making sure you catch errors, you know, code and data quality to help you catch errors before they up in a dashboard or product. Um, I know, you know, and there's three types of testing, really. There's unit testing where you're actually testing your function code. So like an example being- the other one? Um, oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, so, in a, you know, unit testing, you're testing your code, like say I have a function where I say add numbers, X and Y, I then pass in one, one, and I should get two. That is a unit test. Simple as that, that's a unit test. Um, integration testing is where you have your application and how does it work with other systems? It's an integration test. Um, and then last, um, this is more data focused, but data testing. Uh, data testing is really important when you're building data pipelines because it helps you catch data quality problems before they go through your pipeline. Um, and I, it, all, all these things I discussed in the resources section about different tools to use. Uh, I'm gonna quickly go through this. So continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, these are tools I br bring up here because the previously mentioned source control platforms are making them very accessible. Um, where they're making it a really easy for you to accept your continuous integration, where all that really is doing is like running your tests, running your linting, running your formatting, and making sure the code you're committing in is good. And then the deployment side is making sure that uh, you streamline your deployment process. So there's not this like big to do for you deploying your code. And last but not least is the um, cloud computing, where most, you know, Handful of years ago, when I was uh, about five years ago, when I first was like getting into it, you know, a lot of big organizations still were weary of it. Now, nowadays, most companies, when I talk with folks, they're doing either, either they're transitioning to full cloud computing or they're doing a lot of doing hybrid. So I highly recommend checking out any of these three platforms. Um, they all have really pretty generous free tiers. So if you're just wanting to get in and tinker with things, they also have a lot of free materials out there for you to look at, um, which of course they're incentivized for free materials because they want people to use their platform. Uh, <laughs> uh, my personal favorite of course is Amazon, um, but a lot of like bigger enterprise organizations that were already Microsoft based for transitioning to, to Azure. And Google has a lot of interesting data um, and machine learning, um, but you know, I just haven't taken the time to really dive too much into that. Most companies I've worked with have been AWS based. So then last, I'm gonna just quickly, we're at time, but I'm gonna quickly show the survey, uh, which for those of you who don't know, this was built out in Juicebox. Uh, it is a product by, um, it's a product by a local uh, company, Juice Analytics, where they are really trying to streamline the process of making 
they're trying to streamline the process um, of making, you know, telling data stories. Um, I chose them because of the fact that, you know, I just had a couple of simple survey result CSV files that I wanted to kind of publish in an online fashion. I thought this was the best way to do it. Um, so out of people that submitted, a lot of, a lot of data analysts, a lot of data scientists, um, there was a handful of other categories, uh, other people that posted that were other, I just kind of bucketed everything under other, um, but let's jump to this. So wasn't surprised here when I saw Python and SQL kind of just trounced everything else. Um, that was pretty expected. Um, but there was a wide variety of packages. Um, following that, you know, pandas was also another very popular, you know, NumPy is also another big deal. I mean, NumPy was huge for the, you know, scientific computing space for streamlining a lot of like uh, numerical analysis. There's also SciPy, which is on here, but it's a bit lower. NumPy is a bit better known. Um, Excel was another, that was a top one followed by Tableau. Um, VS Code is my, IDE of choice, um, but Adam's another really good one. And of course, Amazon, uh, Amazon was the top. But all right, folks, we are, we are a few minutes over. Um, I'm happy to hang around. Um, I mean, Vim, Vim is a really popular tool, but no one, you know, this was, I didn't actually fill out the survey. I was trying to not be biased. Um, no one submitted it. So, um, Uh, does anyone have any kind of closing uh, comments or questions? I know I just kind of breezed over a lot. All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. Um, as always, I will. Oh. Okay. As always, I will. Do you have something, Meredith? Go ahead. I, I do, um, but I was just going to wait till. Um, if others weren't interested in hearing about it. But I'm just really curious. I, so I am really interested in data engineering and mm -hmm. I, I don't have enough of a background in computer science and math to, to do a graduate degree in computer science at this point. Um, so I've been looking at boot camps, but you know, hardly anybody is offering a data engineering specific one. It's yeah. That I found two places that offer ones that are interesting. There's anyhow, so I'm I'm really curious if you have suggestions on how to train up fast, you know, as fast as it's as is possible, just to get job ready. I know a lot is going to happen just learning on the job, but um, would love your advice there. Um. So that is actually funny enough. I've talked with the folks at National Software School. I'm like, please do a data engineering. Like, I, I know data science is cool and data analytics. I, I do agree, data analytics is big because there's a lot of opportunity there. But so is data engineering, um, and it's just a very it's an untapped space. Um, so ways to kind of level up in data engineering. I mean, SQL and Python are going to be two big things. I'd also recommend a lot of like the virtual environment um and checking out docker tools like that uh, there's i have some resources i'm gonna you know ping me after this uh let me do some researching and i have some resources somewhere that i can send you that are around like recommendations around data engineering um i also probably want to chat with you data engineering is a pretty broad field you know you have everything from okay well how about this i'll probably I'll share, I'll add it to my resources uh, that I'll share with everyone. Um, because data engineering also spans a couple different disciplines. You have like data modeling, data warehousing, you have your kind of traditional ETL where you're like building pipelines and like PySpark or something like that. Um, you know, so there's like a couple of different disciplines you can go and there's like, you know, data architects, you know, there's a couple different things of like in data engineering. Um, so I'd be happy to, I'll add that to the resources section um, and I'll get that posted. I mean, Great, thanks Ale so much. Alex, can I jump in here? Go for it. Um, just a, a, as a response to that, that question, I mean, do you, do you think that there is a, a, a quick and easy way into, into the world of data? 
uh, or is it? Oh, I don't think there's a quick and easy. I think there are resources available for people to work at and get into it. And I think boot camps are a great way. Um, you know, if you have like business experience or a college education, if you're wanting to get into it, you know, I always, it just, it really depends. In fact, um, there was a really good talk at the National Analytics Summit that kind of touched on this topic about like who's getting into data and because it's gonna be a different path for different people. You know, for someone who's just coming out of high school, you know, maybe a boot camp isn't the best thing for you, maybe an undergrad degree because you're gonna learn about learning. You know, undergrad degrees aren't necessarily just about the skills you learn. It's you're learning to learn. You're also, as they put it in the summer, I thought you, you, you need to cook a little more. Um, but if you've been, say, managing a business for 10 years, does it really make sense for you to, you've, you've learned a lot. You know, so maybe a boot camp might be a good way for you to like pivot your career. I think that's a good point. I think sticking to uh, whatever domain you're familiar with, whether that's a, a job, a business or a hobby, um, I'd encourage people to start there. Absolutely. Oh yeah, and for anyone, the, the, the domain part is big. Like if you become, if you have an understanding of the domain and then you tack on understanding, even just like SQL, you just become immediately a rock star because of the fact that, you know, a lot of people in, in, in that space maybe don't have that understanding. So they're relying on data teams. But if you have access to like, if you know SQL, you can then get data for yourself and kind of be a bit more, um, self, self-sufficient, but I have taken a note where I will post some, I'll add some resources for data engineering. Cause yeah, I will admit that it is, while it is a big field there, it hasn't gotten a whole lot of love in terms of like content. I'll message you with a couple of things I've found too, that I'm okay. not sure are really on most people's radar. Just, I'm curious what you think of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Please share with me. I'd be, you know, and if anyone has any resources, uh, feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn. Um, you know, I'd be happy to kind of make this a bit of a living document. Thanks so much, Alex. Of course. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, my little closing spiel is this is a recorded session. Um, you know, I'll get, it usually takes me a day or two to get the recording done. Um, I will get uh, all the resources uh, posted and usually I'll have it out by, uh, I'll have it out by Friday this week. So thank you everyone. Hope you have a good night.